Hi, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Chris Gord. I run product management for our security products group within VMware. So um, essentially we're a part of the network and security business at VMware. Uh, main product that, uh, that VMware has in this space is a product called VMware NSX, which is uh, really built using virtual networking and the concept of software-defined networking to provide uh, really micro-segmentation and avoid lateral movement of, of uh, attacks inside of the data center. Uh, I started about three and a half years ago. Uh, I came from a deep security background. One of the reasons that uh, our team was formed was really because we wanted to be able to look at what other interesting ways could we use the hypervisor as a security control point. Um, so one of the really cool pro uh, properties of, of the hypervisor is this notion that it lives in an isolated control boundary, meaning that if you're trying to protect uh, an operating system or applications running in an untrusted virtual machine, uh, how do you do that by just inserting things inside of the same trust boundary that the attacker is in? So if you're running agents inside the virtual machine, they essentially are you know, fairly easy to be turned off, manipulated, lied to, uh, other things like that. So you try to maintain some level of trusted isolation and some boundary of isolation to secure the environment with, right? Um, so in security, we, we like to call that compensated controls. You have something that's helping control the environment that's not sitting inside the same environment that you're looking to control. Uh, the hypervisor can play a very interesting and valuable role in that context, right? Which is the idea that it can be as close as possible to the thing that it's trying to protect, which is the virtual machine, but still maintain a level of isolation. Uh, which is not a very easy thing to do at the end of the day. And in reality, there's only four companies in the world that can really deliver something of that value. Uh, you know, VMware being one of them with a major hypervisor footprint, but then absent of that, you're looking at somebody who has a major hypervisor footprint in a large public cloud, in which case you're dealing with Microsoft, Amazon, uh, and Google, uh, you know, as, as main providers of that kind of functionality. So, uh, so we'll talk about that and sort of what we deliver. Uh, around this notion of isolation and isolated security. Uh, one of the criti critical things that uh, I really wanted to focus on though is when we talk about the things that we do and the things that we use the hypervisor for, one of the most common things that comes up uh, is this notion of, uh, well, doesn't that sound like whitelisting? Or doesn't that sound like approaches that we've taken in the past to try to control and manage environments by looking for good behavior versus chasing bad behavior? Uh, and a lot of people have tried those types of approaches in the past, and while from a security point of view they're actually quite valuable and quite useful, uh, operationally they can be quite challenging. Uh, so the key here is what have we done ultimately by leveraging the tools at our disposal, leveraging capabilities like machine learning and the cloud uh, and multi-tenancy to really operationalize the idea of least privileged security. So. You know, it's been getting a lot of uh, sort of um, press and, and sort of uh, gravitas lately, this notion of delivering least privileged security. You might have heard of it referred to as zero trust. Uh, however you really want to call it, the idea of being able to create as much of a locked down environment as you possibly can in the data center is valuable from a security point of view, uh, but you need to be able to solve operational challenges. So I'll talk specifically about that and how we've helped operationalize the notion of least privileged security from the application layer all the way down into the network. And you know, a lot of this starts with this notion of you know, why bother in the first place? What's, what's the reason why we do this? Uh, you know, I often don't like to go into the details of like security is, is, is a problem and it's bad and all that kind of stuff. The main gist of this is we're spending more on a regular basis in security. Uh, so if you look at the overall IT spending, you know, you're spending about 4.5% extra a year in IT. If you look at security spend, that's more than double the amount that you're spending in general IT. So um, you basically think of it as security spend is eating into the share of overall IT spending on a year-by-year -year basis, meaning that it's outpacing the growth of general IT, you're spending more of your IT dollars overall on security on a regular basis, which would be nice if you were actually solving a problem, but unfortunately you're not, uh, because your only thing that's outpacing the spend that you have in security is the spend that you have in, in security losses, meaning that the losses are far outpacing what we're spending in terms of actually trying to solve the problem. And this fundamentally just means that the, uh, the, the situation is not solved. It's not even controlled in any way, shape, or form. Uh, ultimately, there's way too many large-scale breaches that are continuing to occur, even if people are trying to spend more and more dollars on security on a regular basis. So 
We just don't have a good solved solution here from a security perspective, no matter what you try to do uh, in terms of uh, looking for and finding uh, bad behavior. Uh, ultimately, those types of approaches are fundamentally uh, uh, difficult to achieve at the end of the day. Uh, and the reason is, you know, if you're, if you're hunting and chasing malicious behavior, uh, by its very nature, it will always be a, a non-complete solution, an unsolved solution, meaning that someone can always create a new uh, way or a new malicious activity that has not been seen before, has a population of one, and can try to subvert whatever you've tried to put in place to find those types of behaviors. So you need to take somewhat of a different approach uh, if you really want to solve this. Uh, the other thing that's quite prevalent is when you look at the way in which we're spending uh, the dollars on a regular basis, we're spending them across a wide array of controls and tools, uh, just way too many uh, to even make sense out of at the end of the day. So we actually ran some studies on this. The average enterprise organization, large enterprise organization, has 40 to 50 different security tools deployed in their environment. Uh, the average enterprise organization has 10 to 15 different endpoint agents installed on either end user devices or on their server machines, um, which is just outrageous when you think about it. I mean, there's no reason that you should have to use that many tools uh, to do something uh, which is fundamentally simple uh, at its core, which is, you know, for security, you really only want the right people to access the right data for the right applications uh, when you need them to, uh, but yet we're using all of these tools to try to find these corner case threat uh, actors, uh, and it's not really a very tenable situation over time. So we need to sort of change the game a little bit, and we need to sort of <laughs> deal with this at the same time as we're modernizing infrastructure. So. Uh, you have infrastructure that's changing underneath you, which is making this harder and harder and harder. People are delivering applications in different ways. Uh, and at the same time, you're trying to solve this, this or tame this beast of security that's out there uh, and, and creates a very difficult landscape to try to fix. So what's really the ways in which uh, you can look at solving or taming this problem? Um, one of the biggest things I always come down to is where, and where do we place our investments to try to get a handle on or control uh, security issues? Um, so a common story I like to tell is I was at RSA Security for, uh, for 10 years. RSA went through a fairly major breach ourselves, uh, the RSA token breach, if any of you recall that. Ultimately what happened was uh, an attacker was able to infiltrate our environment. Uh, they basically you know, sent a zero day phishing uh, as an, a, a phishing attack with a zero-day Adobe exploit uh, alongside of it. It was a nation-state attack, but they basically attacked a normal end-user uh, machine. Uh, that's an infiltration point, so they were able to use an end-user asset to infiltrate the environment. Uh, once they infiltrated the environment, they were able to essentially propagate their attack all the way through into 70 million secure ID token seed records in the database, in a, in a back-end database somewhere, and ultimately exfiltrate all of those records outside of the environment. Now, the issue wasn't that we could not stop the infiltration event from occurring, uh, because it's very difficult to stop infiltration. It's an asymmetric battle trying to stop infiltration, meaning that people can try thousands of times, and they did. This is a major nation-state attacker. Uh, and you have to be right thousands of times if, in order for you to do your job. You have to consistently stop those types of attacks. And again, if they're crafting them specifically for you, it's not easy to do that. It's a very difficult job. The challenge was not that, because the attacker is always going to have the advantage on the infiltration point. The, the challenge was we never layered in enough security investment or capability at later stages in, in the attack chain. So we didn't do enough to stop the propagation of the attack from moving from an end user uh, device back into a, uh, a database with, with millions of critical records on it, at some point during that flow, we should have had the ability of controlling and stopping that type of behavior. Uh, and again, RSA is not a company that lacked for security investment or security expertise or security uh, desire, right? I mean, clearly wanted, you know, we had a security operations center that we would show off on behalf of all EMC. We'd bring people in, walk them around, show them how, how sophisticated we were as a company. And I'm not trying to knock uh, what RSA does, but it, it just shows you how difficult this problem is, and it just shows you in many ways how we're not investing in the right places, right? And the reason for this is we put too much emphasis on the upfront area of the attack chain, and fundamentally the attacker is always going to have the advantage at the upfront area of the attack chain. So the belief that we have as a company is that we need to shift and move a lot of our investment to later stages of the attack chain, uh, look at ways of stopping and controlling propagation of attacks, look at ways of stopping and, and controlling exfiltration of data, and a lot of that is focused on uh, controlling and managing your data center assets more effectively and leveraging least privileged profiles or least privileged uh, concepts 
uh, to be able to control that behavior. So uh, what I mean by least privilege, and I'll explain that in a second, is this idea of create as restricted as an environment as you can so that an attacker does not have the air to breathe when they're inside their data center to do bad stuff once they get there. So if they compromise an end user asset, do not let them get to appropriate or, or uh, important assets in the back end inside the data center. And you have the ability to get the advantage from the attacker when you do that because you know your environment best. You know what should be running, how it should be running. You know the way your applications are set up. You know where to put the controls, where to set up the walls, the access points. Those things allow you to actually gain an advantage over the attack. So that's the net of this, which is if we want to really get a handle on security at the end of the day, we have to be able to layer in these privilege and we have to be able to layer in this notion of, of, of controlling and managing this behavior on our data center. Now the reason that we don't do that uh, at the end of the day is fundamentally it's, it's hard. Um, so you always want to get to the situation where you're not chasing bad behavior, but instead ensuring good behavior. Uh, and, and in theory, right, that's, a, that's an easier problem to solve because you're not looking at millions of malware variants, you're not looking at millions of different ways in which uh, attackers might come after you. You're instead only leveraging and managing a few sets of uh, good behaviors that are normal and expected inside the data center. Uh, in reality, though, it's not always that simple, right, which is uh, the challenge is data centers change, they adjust, applications change, they move around, uh, different things occur. Uh, you have to be able to stay on top and manage that change. So it's not always as simple as just simply trying to lock down things from a static point of view. You have to be able to operationally stay on top of that. Uh, so from a security perspective, there's not uh, a lot of arguing you can do that this is the right approach. The challenge is more operational. Uh, how can you leverage that uh, and deploy it? And I'll talk about that in a second. But all of this notion is something that you know, we've been referring to as the, the concept of cyber hygiene, uh, which is the, this idea of really leveraging uh, capabilities to fundamentally reduce the risk uh, posture inside of the data center. So instead of like, looking at ways of finding threats, uh, really try to create a reduced risk posture in the data center. Uh, and I mentioned that this is getting a lot of attention. A lot of uh, analysts have really pushed this notion. You hear Forrester refer to it as the zero trust model of security. Um, this is something from Gardner. Uh, I love this slide because it speaks very nicely to this concept of uh, least privileged security. Uh, and basically, uh, if you look at this triangle, the one thing you should take away is uh, what Gardner did is they basically said, look, we're going to stack rank security controls for the data center. They call it a cloud workload protection platform, so the cloud workload protection framework. And they said, what are the things that are going to reduce the highest amount of risk that they refer to as foundational security elements at the bottom here? And stack rank them all the way up to the top to the things that reduce the least amount of risk at the, at the top of the pyramid. And they called those you know, the least critical uh, extra uh, security controls, optional security controls at the top. And one thing that always jumps out to people is right at the top of the list here is AV. Um, in the data center, when you're trying to protect the environment, AV is the least valuable control point from a risk reduction point of view inside the data center. Um, uh, and the reason for that is, is fairly simple, right? If people, if, if an attacker has gotten past all of your infiltration points and have propagated their way into the data center, the odds of them just exploding a malicious binary inside the data center and being caught by a simple AV engine is extremely, extremely low, unless they really do not know what they're doing. But they've already gotten past all your upfront controls. Uh, and every once in a while, a customer will tell me, well, we still catch stuff with AV in our, in our servers. And my answer to that is more like, well, what are you doing on your servers? I mean, like, you know, you shouldn't have your servers just downloading arbitrary software and deploying it uh, at will. I mean, that's just, just bad practice. And if you're appropriately handling some things from an operational point of view, the odds of you catching something with AV on the server is very, very low. Uh, and Gardner agrees, right? And this is essentially what they're saying here, which is that AV is the least critical control on a server. If you want to really reduce risk, you should do things that are at the bottom of this pyramid. Uh, hardening configuration vulnerability management being the most critical in their minds. I think you know we have all heard uh, the stories of major attacks and major breaches that have occurred. Almost all of them come down at the end of the day to an unpatched vulnerability that exists somewhere. Uh, you know, sometimes those vulnerabilities are unknown. Sometimes there is no patch available for them. Uh, sometimes it's just laziness on behalf of the customer. But at the end of the day, usually need some sort of vulnerability in something to exploit uh, environments. 
So you clearly should try to maintain and manage uh, vulnerabilities and make sure that you're on top of those. Um, but then if you look up the ladder here, uh, network firewalling, segmentation, and visibility, uh, that's obviously the control that VMware has been delivering with VMware NSX uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, we are now over 7,500 customers deployed uh, on NSX. Uh, so the idea of micro-segmentation and deploying segmentation clearly is getting a lot of, uh, a lot of play out in the field with customers. Uh, and I think it's validated here. It is a very critical control. It does help stop and limit the ability for an attacker to laterally move through the environment, uh, which is obviously very important. Um, but as you go a little bit above that, you know, there are ways, you know, anytime you have a firewall, you have to open up ports on firewalls, you have to open up doors and allow people through firewalls. Uh, that always happens. Uh, if you want to continue to layer on controls, you have to be able to look deeper into the application and see what the application is trying to do with that open door, right? So it's, think of it as, you know, you're opening up a channel from one thing to talk to another thing. How do you know exactly what they're trying to say or if they're saying something bad or if it's someone uh, malicious trying to do that communication? You need to observe at the application layer how it's using the network and how it's using the assets at your disposal. And those are the next three things that sort of Gardner lists here, which is you need to be able to do things like system integrity monitoring to ensure that the system itself is not being exploited or messed with. Uh, you need to be able to do application control and whitelisting to ensure that you're not uh, maliciously, you know, uh, launching binaries that are going to try to do things that are really uh, unallowed or, or inappropriate. Uh, and you need to be able to do things like export prevention and, and memory protection inside the machine um, so you don't have blatant uh, in-memory attacks uh, being, being run inside of the system. Uh, those three things uh, up the ladder here are what we created or set out to create with a product called App Defense. So uh, when we looked at our capabilities and we looked at what the hypervisor can bring to the table, uh, really the ability for us to inspect the virtual machine, control virtual machine memory and behavior, uh, and manage uh, what a virtual machine can do at runtime uh, led very nicely into these three controls, uh, which is really around application control, system integrity, and memory protection. Um, and that's how we stack our controls together. If you think about what NSX and App Defense bring to the table, it's really trying to deliver a full stop core protection strategy uh, for our customers uh, to really create this notion of cyber hygiene uh, and risk reduction inside the data center. Um, so why, not, why doesn't everyone do this? Uh, so I used, uh, I actually had a, a talk at VMworld, which, which basically, uh, you know, was titled uh, Great Power, Great Responsibility, and I often use this quote. Uh, the reason is, you know, when you're dealing with least privileged security, you have the ability to arbitrarily control any single behavior in the data center, meaning I can block a network connection, I can stop a process from executing, uh, you know, I can control what memory can be accessed on a virtual machine. There's all kinds of uh, power that you have at your disposal if you're trying to secure an environment by taking a least privileged approach. And that's what people tend not to like, is um, they don't like blocking legitimate behaviors. But, and that's really what gets people frustrated the most, which is software change might occur, an upgrade might happen, your developers might want to change something. Next thing you know, you're blocking legitimate application behavior and everyone goes crazy because they don't want this notion of legitimate behavior being blocked. Uh, so then people start to pull back from this notion of least privileged security because they want to allow for easier operations and easier deployment of apps. Uh, and then you start to chip away at this least privileged concept uh, and a lot of people then can't realize the benefits of it. So you have to be able to wield this responsibility of being able to arbitrarily control behavior very carefully and you have to be able to do it in a way that aligns with the operations of a modern data center. Um, and, and that's what we've really set out to do here is solve this operational challenge. Um, another great quote from Gartner, uh, which talks about the, uh, you know, the operationalization of whitelisting projects. Uh, basically, they point out that over 90% of the alerts and the behaviors that you're blocking or alerting on inside of a whitelisted environment, a least privileged environment, uh, is false positives, basically, at the end of the day. So they, they say, you know, you're dealing with a large amount of potential alerts. Almost all of those are going to be false positives. Very few of them are going to be malicious behaviors. Uh, so the challenge here is not necessarily finding bad stuff. The challenge here is managing operational uh, change inside the data center. And if you can do that well, then you've effectively created a very good security model 
Um, it doesn't have a lot of opportunity for false negatives, meaning bad stuff can't get through, uh, but you're still maintaining good operations. Now, the way Gardner kind of explained how to solve this problem was mostly people and process related. You know, if you read this report, which I recommend you do if you're interested in this topic, it basically said, look, if you have good people, if you have a good process, if you control the way you introduce software into the environment, uh, problem solved, right? So they, they basically put the burden back on the user. You know, you guys should do a better job deploying software and maintaining a control uh, environment, and therefore, you know, you won't necessarily run into problems with whitelisting. Uh, we don't necessarily fully believe that. It's very difficult, ultimately, to control those types of behaviors. So we've taken the approach to use some, some modern techniques to actually operationalize these types of uh, uh, common occurrences of false positives uh, and actually make it a lot easier to maintain least privileged security uh, inside of the data center. So <clears throat> before I get into that, I just want to touch on AppDefense as a product uh, and just quickly give you guys a level set uh, on sort of how it works. Um, so the key here is there's, there's two components really at the end of the day on what AppDefense does. Uh, the first thing is it wants to understand completely uh, everything about your data center and the applications that you're running in the data center uh, from top to bottom. And this is all about the capture and analysis of the behavior that's occurring inside the data center. The second thing it wants to do is it wants to be able to control that behavior uh, either by uh, seeing uh, behavior that's deviating from normal and stopping it, controlling it from occurring, so completely blocking it, or alerting the users on the fact that there is deviation from normal behavior and allowing them to respond to those events accordingly, either inside the infrastructure or via some other mechanism. Now, the way in which we go about capture and analyzing behavior very much is, is, is tied into the infrastructure itself. So the first thing we want to do, obviously, since we're delivering this on top of uh, virtual machines and virtual environments, is fully understand all of the virtual machines that you're running inside of, uh, inside of uh, vCenter. So they have this notion of uh, an intended state engine. And the intended state engine is really built around trying to understand and model what every single virtual machine does and what it's used for uh, inside of your data center. So if we see a virtual machine come in through vCenter, a new virtual machine, uh, we put that virtual machine into something called unclassified state, meaning that it's actually it basically an orphan. We don't know why it's there. We don't know what it's being used for. We're going to start collecting data for that virtual machine to try to see if we can classify it appropriately. But until we have a good handle on it and a good model of it, uh, it's going to be in this unclassified state for some period of time. Um, and we have a number of ways in which we try to correlate and, and collect all the data about what a virtual machine is used for. So a common way of, of collecting and understanding uh, behavior is just uh, looking at runtime behavior, right? So clearly, if we could just observe and see things that are occurring at runtime, uh, we have the ability to start modeling and, and kind of reverse engineering what that virtual machine is used for. So for example, if we at runtime see a certain set of binaries executing that we know belong to Microsoft Exchange, it's a reasonable assumption that this machine is, is part of the cluster that's delivering the Microsoft Exchange application. Uh, and because of the position that we have inside the hypervisor, we can natively inspect all of these behaviors uh, and not necessarily put a lot of burden uh, on sort of deploying agents into the environment in order to get those kind of behaviors. So that's the first thing we do is we simply try to collect information at runtime. Uh, and we actually recently uh, announced the ability to natively collect those things at runtime inside of vCenter. Um, so just going to show you quickly what that looks like, just to give you guys a, uh, an idea. This works. So this is uh, the vSphere client, right? This is essentially what, uh, if you're comfortable or have seen vCenter before, this is what people use to manage their hosts uh, inside of vCenter. So inside of a host, uh, you have essentially uh, a set of uh, host assets, so this is a cluster, and a cluster has a set of host assets, so these are the, the bare metal machines that are running uh, ESX on top of them in order for you to deliver virtual machines, and then on top of those hosts, there's a bunch of virtual machine assets that you're running, uh, which obviously can be spun up and spun down at will. So one of the key things here is that we can run a, um, we can run a uh, app defense essentially without installing or managing any new agents, right? So one of the key things here is inside of vCenter, we can simply enable uh, this cluster, this entire cluster, to run app defense uh, through a click of the button. So without having to install any additional agents, you just simply enable this cluster across 10 hosts, 
uh, and we'll be able to go out and install all the components that are required natively uh, directly inside of vCenter. So that makes things super easy. Uh, but then also the visibility that you start to get at runtime once those things are deployed uh, is nat natively built into vCenter, right? So if you come in here, immediately you can see here are all the hosts in which are enabled with AppDefense. Uh, and here is all of the reputation processes and data that we're collecting at runtime. Uh, and then we can show you all of the activity that those processes are exhibiting at runtime. So where they're running, as well as the inbound and outbound connection activity that is occurring. So this is part of the uh, runtime learning phase, the validation phase that happens during runtime. Where we're pulling in all this information, passing it through some analysis to tell you whether it's uh, expected or normal behavior for this process. Uh, and then we actually can provide you with some understanding of um, how much we fully have modeled this machine at runtime based on all this information that we collect. Um, now the key here is uh, you're not just sort of collecting random information and just calling it a day and adding it to the whitelist, but the key is that you're collecting all this information uh, and you're putting it through some level of analysis, right? So. I don't know why this takes so long to get up and running. Uh, so the, the, the key is we want to be able to take this information that we're collecting and gathering and compare it against the population so that we can understand whether this is normal behavior or whether this is uh, something that is an outlier behavior. So the more that we can sort of model normalcy and tell you whether this is something that's expected, the easier it is for you to create and manage this whitelist because it's not just you that's whitelisting behavior, it's a population of virtual machines, right? VMware has 50 to 60 million virtual machines running and deployed at any given time. Over, over that population of virtual machines, we can create a model that says this is normal behavior, this is not normal behavior for that particular binary. And again, it's a lot easier to model normalcy than it is to model maliciousness because normalcy happens in almost every instance of a virtual machine. Maliciousness happens in very few instances of virtual machines. So the idea of modeling normal is much easier because we can compare against a much larger population. So this whole process feeds into the backend system and we actually just put that against our models to try to tell you whether something is normal behavior or abnormal behavior. So those were the green check marks that we have against the processes inside of vCenter. Is it has been vetted through our uh, learning process. We've been able to verify that this is normal compared to the population, which helps you reduce the vast amount of noise in terms of creating and setting up a whitelist of behaviors. Uh, after that learning process occurs, at the end of the day, you have what, what we refer to as a VM manifest or an application manifest. Think of that as essentially a, a um, uh, a blueprint for the way in which an application or a virtual machine should behave at runtime. So we, we've modeled all these behaviors a, 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 as we've learned them. We created this blueprint. We take that blueprint and we stamp it down to the virtual machine directly. And then we can use that blueprint to start modeling and controlling behaviors um, uh, as they occur post the learning phase in the protected phase. Now the key in the protected phase is you're essentially using the hypervisor as a way in which you're controlling and managing this behavior, right? So instead of just blindly running an agent inside of the guest virtual machine, the hypervisor can actually do this enforcement on your behalf. So the hypervisor essentially acts as this protected boundary. Uh, and inside of that protected boundary, we can place uh, the app defense monitoring component and we can place this blueprint, the virtual machine manifest, so that it's protected from the rest of the untrusted operating system. Uh, and coincidentally, you can also have a direct network channel from that untrusted operating system down into the, uh, into the hypervisor without ever actually using uh, the TCP network stack on the machine. So we can communicate up and down between the virtual machine. The machine can be completely quarantined off the general network, and yet we can still communicate with it. And then we can also inspect and control behavior from a protected position without being manipulated. Um, so that's essentially post the learning period, we push this into the quote unquote protected mode where the hypervisor now becomes this sort of watchdog for the behaviors that are occurring inside of the untrusted operating system. And we can always compare it against the blueprint. And as soon as we see a deviation, we can start act acting accordingly, which is either blocking those behaviors or alerting on those behaviors being, being shown. So these two things work hand in hand. Obviously you can't have a uh, a rule set without first understanding things. That's why we go through the learning phase. You can't have uh, a true protected environment unless you can ensure that that protected environment is not being manipulated or turned off by attackers. And that's where the hypervisor kind of creates this, this, this uh, controlled space 
uh, in order for it to monitor and see the behavior that's occurring. So quickly getting into uh, some details here as to why people really struggle with some of these models, right? So the first is this notion of uh, limited server real estate for running agents. Now, the benefit here is that uh, essentially there is no additional agent that needs to be installed at all in order for this to run appropriately. Uh, one of the reasons for that is uh, VMware has a component called VM tools which gets used inside of virtual machines. Uh, it's a set of drivers, components, uh, other things that need to be installed for the guest operating system to operate normally in a virtual machine environment. Uh, the app defense components are built in directly into the VM tools uh, uh, capability, right? So uh, if you do a full install of VM tools, essentially all the requirements for you to run app defense are already there. Uh, so you don't need to run additional agents uh, inside of the environment. Uh, the second piece here is this notion of lack of isolation. So again, if you're trusting an agent and the guest to be your control point, your control position, not a watchdog, but a control position, meaning it has to govern behavior and allow behavior to occur, then you better be sure that that agent is actually still up and running, still operational, and is not easily manipulated or shut off. Uh, and if you can't do that, it's not easy to trust that component, right? So think of it this way, if I'm trusting an agent to to stop things, and I can easily turn that agent off, even for a second or a minute, execute something maliciously, leave, and then the agent heartbeats itself and says, oh, I need to wake back up, it wakes back up. Well, you, you, you just left a gaping hole for some period of time for people to do something malicious on the device. And during that time period, they could have rootkitted the machine, they could have put something malicious there uh, that has persistence. There's all kinds of things they can do as soon as they shut off that agent. So the idea that you have to be able to control your protection uh, or really protect your control position uh, all the time uh, is extremely critical, right? And, and again, that's why people like firewalls, that's why they like compensating controls, is because they have to have things outside of the environment that can protect it. The idea that we have the hypervisor at our disposal to leverage this isolated uh, uh, point of view and control the environment without being manipulated uh, can be hugely valuable. The third piece here is this notion of uh, behavioral threats, right? So uh, behavioral threats are basically, uh, think of those as, as non-malware related uh, uh, threats and activity. Uh, meaning, what if I run a PowerShell script and a PowerShell script uh, executes some, some bad stuff that it probably shouldn't be doing, but it's using all appropriate open firewall ports, it's trying to use uh, legitimate software to, to execute some sort of malicious behavior. Uh, that's essentially a, a quote unquote behavioral threat. Um, and it's difficult for whitelisting to stop, the traditional whitelisting to stop behavioral threats because PowerShell is a perfectly valid executable. Uh, it's signed by Microsoft. It's, uh, it's a very trusted in almost every single reputation feed that you get. Uh, it has a known good publisher. Uh, it's difficult when you look at just that executable on its surface to say that it should not be trusted and whitelisted. Uh, so when you're dealing with whitelisting, most of the time, to avoid the operational burden, people just simply say, if something is signed by a known uh, signee, if it's, if it's a known trusted publisher, all good, you're allowed to run it. And you know, obviously things like PowerShell are, meet all those criteria, but then they can still do very bad things at the end of the day. So you need to be able to combine uh, execution behavior, so binaries executing, with the way in which those binaries are behaving. And Inside of AppDefense, we do both of those things. So we, we look at not just who is executing and how it's executing, we actually also look at what you're doing on the network and how you're using that executable to communicate on the network. Uh, and on this alongside of NSX, kind of creating a controlled environment across both process execution and network activity can actually stop a, a much wider array of behavioral threats than you could get with just binary execution and watching for whitelisted binaries. Uh, for example, we show all the time someone trying to create a reverse TCP uh, connection or creating a reverse TCP shell using PowerShell or Python as a way of communicating back out to a command and control server. That is almost impossible for a traditional whitelisting to stop unless you blacklisted PowerShell as an executable. In our case, because of the fact we're monitoring what that binary is doing on the network and it's making a command and control connection outside, we can easily see and stop those kind of things from happening. So the idea of combining execution with, with behavior uh, is an important sort of juxtaposition for this to work appropriately. Uh, manual recreation, I talked about our learning process. So most whitelisting systems have the, the need to create manual rules, set up these individual uh, policies. Uh, none of that is built into the product. So 
just to give you a sense the way in which we treat rules inside of AppDefense, it's almost all related to um, uh, just simply turning on or turning off with things you want to stop and control versus actually creating manual rules. So after we go through the learning process, um, we basically have, uh, let me open this in a new, so after we go through the learning process, we've modeled all these behaviors for you and all these executables for you, including what they do on the network. So if you dig into any one of these, you can see exactly how it behaves in the network. But then you can also set up these rules, and these rules are as simple as turning on or turning off enforcement for any one of these specific um, uh, activities, right? So you can say, I, I want to enforce process monitoring, I don't want to enforce process monitoring. And this is the only rule that needs to be manipulated or adjusted in terms of what you want to enforce and how you want to take action on those events when they occur. So you can change the action to block, uh, and you can sort of adjust how you want that action to occur. Uh, and this is done purposely. Right? We don't want people to go in and manually have to create individual security rules, like you're managing a, a, a firewall table of 10,000 different activities. Uh, we want all the learning to be done more automated, and we want the ability to be able to enforce different things uh, in a, in a uh, easier way of turning on or turning off these switches. So that vastly reduces the burden uh, to do manual rule creation. Uh, the other big two things at the end here are all about using our collective understanding of, of behavior. The first being this notion of uh, understanding the unknown. Uh, what I mean by that is if you're, if you're gonna properly try to whitelist the system and say that only certain things are allowed, uh, you need to not just whitelist the things that you are aware of. Like, let's say you know that your, your application communicates to the database over port 3306, right? That's one of probably 150 to 200 different behaviors that occur on a machine. And the vast majority of those 200 behaviors are usually Microsoft doing really weird things at runtime, like, you know, making DNS connections, calling Microsoft Live Update, running SVC hosts, you know, dash uh, net services, communicating on ephemeral port ranges up and down. Uh, and no one really could answer why those things are occurring. Like unless you're a reverse engineer and you know exactly what operating systems do on a regular basis, it's so hard for you to say, this is exactly why Microsoft is making that call. Uh, and again, I'm not blaming them. There's security agents that do this all the time. If you try to control anything in an environment, you have to not just model the application you understand, you have to model all the behaviors in the machine. And that's really hard. That, that can be a very difficult task to do to really understand all of these behaviors. So what we do with AppDefense, again, using the, the multi-tenant nature of the system and using our collective knowledge of normal operating system behavior, is we basically look across the population and we try to model out all of this uh, noise in the system. Meaning that SVC host, at the end of the day, we can tell you, using the ML model in the cloud, whether SVC host, the activity that we see in your environment, is normal compared to the rest of the population. And we show that with a simple sort of behavioral verification flag. We just simply say, we've modeled this executable, we verified its behavior, it is normal compared to the rest of the population. Um, so all of that essentially creates this idea of above the line behaviors and below the line behaviors. And if we can just say that we can take all the noise out of the system, make it below the line, you don't have to worry about it. It's taken an awful lot of manual burden off this idea of creating whitelisting behavior. So that's the power of using this multi-tenant system in the cloud, is that it gives us the ability uh, to really reduce the noise for most customers. And then the last piece here is, is dealing with change. So how do we use that same concept of understanding normalcy across the population to deal with change on a regular basis? Meaning that when we see different things occur, do they have to always be handled uh, manually or can we somehow handle those automatically and adapt to those behaviors at runtime because we know that they're normal or expected based on what we see across the rest of the population. So a good example of this is a software upgrade. If you get software, legitimate software that does an auto update of itself, essentially what that does is it generates new behavior. It now is a new executable, it's possibly communicating differently on the network how do I deal with that? Do I just you know, blindly block it and tell you I block something? Or should I use that knowledge that I have across the population and say, you know what? Everybody else is, is whitelisted and is running this new version of software or enough of the population has whitelisted or used this new version of software that inherently it should be trusted uh, and you should not have to worry about uh, blocking this type of behavior and we can automatically adjust the rules to account for that. 
Uh, so this notion of auto dealing with auto updates, uh, allowing behaviors that maybe weren't caught during the learning period, uh, all of that fits into a bucket that we call adaptive uh, segmentation or adaptive least privileged security, which gives us the ability to sort of uh, kind of sway in the wind a little bit. You know, think of it as like if you built a skyscraper and you never allowed it to sway in the wind, uh, it would not be very, uh, very stable. So you have to sway. And if you can sway and sort of, you know, move a little bit based on the conditions that are happening inside the data center, but do that with knowledge, enough knowledge that this behavior is appropriate, then you can actually make this a lot easier and manageable over time. Uh, so all of that's built directly into the system. You have the ability to run uh, in this adaptive mode that basically gives you the ability to adjust and change the rule set, not just for what AppDefense is doing, but also what you can do with the firewall uh, inside of NSX. Uh, so most of this is just what I went through here. Uh, the one thing I'll point out is you know, how we deal with um, uh, this concept of, of behavioral awareness. Um, so I, I skipped over that part in the product before because we're running out of time, but uh, this notion of understanding behavior uh, full stop is built directly into the product, right? This idea that we're not just looking at execution behavior, but we're looking at how it's communicating on the network. So you can look at any machine in this system and see the way in which it's communicating to other things around it and also see the way in which it's communicating to external entities, you know, whether it's communicating to public IPs, other private IPs, other virtual machines. And you can see specifically the binaries that are doing the communication, right? So in this case, if I wanted to know who's communicating to external IPs inside of my environment, uh, I can see specifically that SVC host is communicating with an array of public IPs across these port ranges, which allows you to sort of really, again, uh, get this full understanding of, of not just execution, uh, but, but actually behavior, post-execution, what those things are doing. Uh, and this becomes a lot easier to start to see abnormally, oh, abnormalities in the system when you're modeling this based on behavior, right? So uh, clearly if you had PowerShell or something like that making external network calls, that opens up a much more you know, bigger red flag uh, by looking at it in this, in this direction. Um, so again, this, uh, to, to sort of recap here, we believe very heavily in this idea of, of sort of this continuous learning process and continuous uh, uh, protection process, right? So um, uh, you'll hear Gardner also refer to this as the DevSecOps uh, model. But the idea is that if you want to make sure that you're, you're keeping this uh, security profile uh, appropriate at all times, you have to be able to continually adapt and learn to the changing conditions that occur inside the data center. And that could either be people legitimately introducing new software, that could be software that's updating itself automatically, that could be some other thing that you haven't caught during the learning period that just happens to be new behavior that maybe you just hadn't seen during the weeks that you were doing the learning and modeling. But all of those things would change, and in order for you to really maintain this and operationalize this, you have to be able to continuously model and learn that change. Uh, so that's really what, what we've done with, with App Defense is this idea of uh, embedded intrinsically inside the infrastructure, uh, look at all of these behaviors, not just at, at a point in time, but continuously, and then adapt and change the rule sets where necessary uh, using the collective knowledge of the population that we understand. Uh, and doing this effectively allows us to maintain a least privileged profile, get much higher security benefits, but not be burdened with a lot of the operational difficulties that, that whitelisting has, uh, has uh, have had in the past. Uh, that's really it for this. So just to recap on the things that we've done. Any any questions? I know we're ended on time. Is this available only with NSX? No. So NSX is not a requirement here at all. Uh, so if I have a VMware in your environment, yes. Data yes. So you can now you can you can you could always have run this completely independently of NSX. But the only requirement today is that you run ESX in the environment. Uh, it has to be ESX 6.5 or above because we use the hypervisor as a way of inspecting behavior. Um, and then we've also announced there's a, a vSphere version called vSphere Platinum that has App Defense embedded right into it. So, so is this something I, I probably already have? I don't know it. Or is it uh, you don't probably already have it. Uh, so uh, unless you've purchased it independently, but uh, it, vSphere Platinum launches in October. So it's basically a, a version of vSphere that has it embedded. But in, in ESX 6.5, we, we basically think of it as laid the foundation for this. So you, you have the components that can run it if you have 6.5. You just may not have be uh, running it right now. It's licensed per CPU. So similar to ESX and NSX, um, because virtual machines spin up and spin down, it's hard to do things based on a VM model. So we always license per CPU to make things simply. Uh, it's, a, it's a SaaS product, so it's licensed per CPU per year. 
Um, it's five hundred dollars for CPU per year, just to give you exact pricing. Uh, so uh, fairly, I think, uh, approachable from a price point. Any additional questions? So the population you're talking about is it the population of VMs I have in my environment, or is it going out? No, no, it's going out to the cloud. Yeah, it goes out to the cloud. It, uh, it's population of every VM that we've been able to get uh, data from inside of AppDefense, basically. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's good that you say that. A lot of people don't view it that way. I got into many, many heated debates about that, but <laughs> I think it's 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 always beneficial to use population analysis. What I often tell people is they do it anyway, right? I mean, reputation databases uh, exist for years. VirusTotal is a crowdsourced reputation database. Uh, that's trusted widely as a security control, uh, and all of that is built off of collective knowledge and collective data. Uh, same thing with, with uh, signature databases from AV systems. All of those things, uh, in theory, could be poisoned, quote unquote, and you can say, I'm going to inject malicious executables into a signature database from McAfee. Uh, it's just very hard to execute those things in practice, and the reality, it's much more dangerous if someone's breaking into your environment than breaking into a collective, uh, it's like breaking into the bank versus stealing something from your home. It's kind of hard to break into a bank at the end of the day, right? So more attacks happen, people breaking into your home. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.